hello everyone, my name is Marko Suvajic, and um, I kind of have a dual personality with two different interests in my life. Uh, I love education, I love teaching, and I also love making video games. So um, in, th in those two roles, yes, I am a director of innovation and entrepreneurship at the Digital Worlds Institute at University of Florida, and I also run um, video game studio O2D, uh, which is San Francisco headquartered with production studio here in Belgrade. Um, I firmly believe in two things in my life. I firmly believe that education and learning, th they are the way of how humanity will progress, how we will, you know, our civilization will get better. And I feel that that is one of the things that I have to dedicate my life to support that growth and improve how our civilization grows. In parallel to that, I also would call myself a hedonist. I believe in hedonistic imperative. I believe that most of the things that we do, we can do them in a fun way. That things do not necessarily have to be hard. That we do not have to experience things in a manner that makes us not want to do them. Um, and so when I think of those two things, I work on putting them together somehow. So at the University of Florida, um, I teach classes in relationship to video game design, to entrepreneurship, um, and, and we teach classes that are both online and offline, and we have online students that are with us in real time with a video conferencing software. So there's a lot of very specific challenges of how to work with students who are maybe physically remote, but are with us in virtual world, so to say, and how to pass on this knowledge when their attention is really hard, it's very fleeting. You know, it's really hard to get somebody to focus on what I'm talking about when they have access to all kinds of really fun stuff that many of us are, you know, are responsible of creating. You know, there's all these video games, all this fun Facebook stuff that is competing for their attention in comparison to my lecture that may or may not be as interesting as what they're doing at the, at the moment. So it's a great, great challenge. Um, and in parallel to that, I do make the, those other things that take the students' attention away, um, which is video games as pure entertainment. Right? So those two things are now, in the last five years, starting to merge. They're starting to mesh. And for the first time ever, we are starting to have something that um, is slowly redefining the way that we learn. And one of the biggest, biggest driving forces is the gamification of education. The word gamification became somewhat of a hot word in the last several years, and we started seeing um, you know, we are gamifying the workplace, we're gamifying the TV watching experience, everything is starting to be gamified. And there's a really good reason, because again, if we want students to engage, if we want people to engage, we have to make it fun. People today expect to do fun things, and if it's not fun, they're just not going to do it. So in, in gamifying education, what we're doing, we are taking certain game mechanics, and we are applying them to the non-gaming world, right? So how to make learning fun. How to um, get the students in the state of flow. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the flow theory by gentleman uh, Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi. <laughs> um, the, however, this theory has been around for 25 years. And what he's talking in the flow theory is that it's the moment when a person is engaged with the activity to its fullest extent, where they become completely ignorant of anything else that is happening, and they're fully engaged. We can take examples like um, mountain climbing or extreme sports. It's when we feel like we are 100% engaged in doing something, right? But we also see the same thing with kids playing video games. I have two kids, and when they play video games, it's, you know, they don't even hear me when I ask them, like, come eat, and it doesn't register at all. They're in a state of flow. They're fully engaged. Well, unfortunately, schools have struggled tremendously to create this state of flow with learning. 
it, in, in competition with all these other activities, learning is becoming a drag. It's becoming boring and it's becoming increasingly more and more difficult because the competition is becoming fierce. Until recently, okay, I will read something, and if I wanted to spend some time doing something else, I really kind of had to put the book down and go and actually do something different. Well, now that's not really the case. I'm at the computer, I'm trying to do something, and somebody is Skyping me, and I have a Facebook, and oh, I just want to see the update on my Twitter account, and it's becoming increasingly difficult to maintain the state of flow for students. So, in a way, it's, it's one of those sayings, if you cannot beat them, join them, right? So, how can we make education just as engaging? How can we make it just as much fun so when students are given to do something, they actually want to do it? And one of the ways to do it is to make it fun, is to gamify it, is to make it something that they actually don't really care that they're learning. Oh, we're learning too? That's great. You know, I'm actually thinking that I'm just watching a, a playing a, a game. Now, there are a few other reasons why we are introducing games into the world of education. One is the voice of an expert. What is happening today is that, well, we have access to so much knowledge through internet that it's becoming very difficult to convince anyone that they should study at your institution. Maybe MIT has enough you know, authority to say, come here and this will be amazing. But in reality, I have access to so many experts around the world through internet that it's hard to say, well, I'm going to just now study with these few people. Come study with our institution, right? And you will have this limited access to the experts. So what video games allow for is to multiply the voice of the experts. So I can make a video game and I can collaborate with two, three, four, five, 55 experts in a given field. I can gain all that knowledge, I can make it and build it in into the video game, and then that video game can be played by millions of students. And they're all working with the knowledge that has been created with the help with the top experts in the field. This is amazing. This is something that we never really had opportunity to do, to do in anything even remotely uh, similar uh, to what we are able to do now in video games and collaborating with experts. Another really big thing is data collection. So, um, as we know, in, data, in, in, in playing video games, we have access to tremendous amount of data. What did somebody do? How did they do it? What, how many times did they try to solve a puzzle? How many times did they fail? So on and so forth. Well, in the traditional educational model, I don't have insight to anything. I, you know, I just know that somebody had you know, made 10 right answers out of 20, and that's it. I have no idea how long it took them. I have no idea how many times did they change anything. Nothing. Now, with doing this through video games, or making it online and having databases, I have access to all this data, how long somebody took to, make some, to, to um, answer something. Uh, did they try many times or not as many times? Uh, so on and so forth. And all the data just sits there, and I can query it, in any way that I find useful to what I'm doing, right? So this is a tremendous asset to teachers who now can actually probe and understand who is doing how in their classes for the first time ever. Which brings us to the point five here, which is adaptive learning. Adaptive learning is something that um, is actually really quite amazing. Uh, this year, China has been by far the biggest spender in regards to purchasing software, video games, uh, online solutions for adaptive learning. What this is, it's a student-focused learning, individual student, right? So um, I like to call it CPU assistance learning because I take it from the video games when you, know, like when you race and if you're really far away, often the video game will kind of help you out by making you a little bit faster than your opponent so you can catch up and keep it fun. Because if the, you know, the computer opponent escapes you too far, I mean, it's really not fun to play anymore, right? Like, you have to get me a little bit closer so I can get excited. Or if I'm really good, slow me down or get the, you know, the CPU gets to be a little bit better so it gets to be kind of fun again. 
Um, in adaptive learning, it's a similar concept. Basically, what's happening is that today, when we make a curriculum uh, for any particular class, it's made with an average student in mind. Average student doesn't necessarily exist. It's the statistical average. So if I have 30 students, well, I might have three average students. And most of the rest of them might be either ab you know, above or below the average. So what happens, I'm delivering my lecture, and these three students are going, wow, this is great. This is just the right pace for me. And the rest of them are either bored out of their mind because they know everything that I'm already ta telling them and they're ahead of the curve and they're just kind of like, oh man. And the other half is struggling because they can't keep up. They don't know anything about it and I'm too fast for them. But I can't, I don't have time to adjust myself for these extremes. I am delivering the way I have to in order to commit myself to the particular syllabus that I have, right? So what adaptive learning does, it really takes it to the level of one-on-one -on -one, uh, teaching, where now that I'm playing a game and I'm interacting with the CPU, with the OS, I am actually capable of spending an hour or five or 14 hours learning how to do something. Computers are infinitely patient. You know, They're, they really don't mind if we try something many, many, many times. So what it does, now when we make educational games, we can make it so, aha, wait a second, this person is really struggling with this puzzle. Maybe we should introduce few easier puzzles from the database, right? We have a data bank of quizzes and puzzles and mini games. So now let's do an easier one. Let's see how he or she does with that. If they don't do good, we'll make it even easier. And until we find that common, like, oh, this is where they are. And then we st you know, slowly start lifting them up until they reach the level of knowledge that we need to deliver in that particular case. So adaptive learning really is the future, and it really is where gamified education is definitely um, going to be. Um, it kind of sounds a little bit like a sci-fi, and um, if we look in the future, this is one of my favorite scenes from the recent Star Trek movie where they show the future. Uh, we are nowhere near that, but the message there is that each individual student has his own environment with which he or she is interacting, and that environment will adapt to the pace of every individual student. What we do have today is a market that is growing, and it's growing at a tremendous pace. It's growing where uh, today uh, we are having learning games that, uh, you know, we are headed to the $1.5 billion market. This is huge, and it's only getting bigger. Um, it's predicted it to be 2.3 billion by 2017. These numbers are huge, and they do not actually include another big, big, big section here, which also can be um, put in under the educational games, which are the large scope uh, simulators, so that military uses and so on and so forth. They're just so big that maybe some of those numbers are not relevant to the standard game developers and publishers. Uh, another big thing is that these companies are raising lots of money. Investors want to give money to educational companies because they see that this is a trend. It's an easy early moment where they realize that whoever gets in this game early on will become huge. And there is also this slight moment of doing the right thing, that if they have a couple of options, you know, should we invest in this company or this company? Well, you know what? There is certain altruistic goodness in doing this towards the education, and we're actually seeing that, that investors are supporting that with their dollars, with their wallets, not just saying things. It is actually uh, a market that is raising significant amount of money. Um, some of the big names in the industry, um, Bill and Melinda Gates uh, just gave up, gave $100,000 
uh, found, uh, funds, grants to the institutions who engage in further gamification of education in order to help them create partnerships with game developers. Because what happens is that, let's say University of Florida, we come up with an idea to make a game. Great. Now, we know what needs to be taught in that particular class. We'll come up with, aha, uh -huh, here are the goals, here are what needs to be accomplished, so on and so forth. But um, we don't really know how to make it. Like, we don't know how to make a game. That's not what we do. We create knowledge. So it's necessary to start creating the partnerships with publishers and developers alike. Now, the big universities probably prefer to have relationships with publishers because they're huge and they don't really necessarily want to deal with small entities. But smaller colleges will be interested in working with smaller teams that can become part of their project and make this happen, right? I love the name of this grant, it's Impatient Optimist. Um, I really just share that sentiment with them. Uh, another, um, another effort that is happening right now between also Bill Melinda Gates Foundation and McGraw Hill, they just put together a $6 million fund to create a nonprofit um, game, video game studio to, uh, to make 10 educational games. So money is there. Things are really moving uh, quite fast at this moment, and within five to 10 years, this will really become a norm of how we learn. Um, now, there are a couple of reasons why this is happening right now and didn't happen before. One big thing is that the devices that we use are becoming smaller. Primarily, the mobile is pushing this um, development, right? Mostly tablets. Another thing is that internet is becoming something that we just have access to all the time and everywhere. And it's not something that a school has to provide and it's maybe complicated and you have to log. No, I, it's just expected if I have tablet, I am on, online all the time. And I have access to my grades, I have access to my quizzes, I have access to my homework, to everything in this little tablet that I have with me all the time. It's huge. Another th big thing is that there's a huge pressure on the schools because it's becoming harder and harder to prove that the kids who are graduating are actually having any meaningful skills. They have skills, but it's kind of, a lot of people are saying, you know, we're wondering if kids today actually know as much as they did 15 years ago. So there's this need to prove that they actually do have certain skills. And standardized testing is being introduced across the board in the United States in order to make sure that we know exactly what is going on and which schools are actually delivering on their promise to teach students how to perform certain tasks. And the last one is adoption of brain science software, which um, will happen maybe in five to 10 years. So it's gonna be something that will happen um, in the future. If you make it a game, Gamers will play it no matter what your motivation is in making it. This is a quote from Reality is Broken, where uh, I love Jane, she's great. I think she's one of the star game designers and doing it for a good cause. Um, so I love promoting anybody who can get our industry um, on the front of the TVs and, and, and the newspapers and such. So, and I believe in this. I have a personal example. This is a screenshot of a taxi meter. So I have a 10-year-old boy, and when he was six, we used to play this game. We would get in a cab, and he would watch the taxi meter, and he would learn uh, math, he would learn addition by adding the digits. So, you know, here he would just kind of look and go, 9, 3, 12, 16, uh, 22. But it's hard because on a taxi meter, the numbers keep changing. And faster we go, they change faster and faster. So he would sit there, full, like, Talk about the flow, talk about the state where he, he would stand and look at the taximeter and just go, 15, 2, 18. Um, when he started first grade, he was by far the best, the best mathematician in their class. Nobody else was even close to it. They were like, oh, we're adding to 10. And he was like, oh, I'm adding to whatever, 550, which is how much the digits of my taximeter things were working out. So. Um, 
to him, that was just a game. He had no clue that he was actually doing math on, along the way and learning algebra. Literally, it was just a game. So this happens over and over and over. Um, United States has a lot of standardized testing. And one big thing that is happening right now is, you know, while there is a huge push, toward, push away towards like, well, we don't know games, that's not serious, we don't want to do it, so on and so forth, we cannot argue with results. And results are for real. Where every time a solid game has been introduced into the curriculum, the results were there. After the, after the you know, fact that kids were playing these games, we would have 100%, 50% increase in, standard, in the results of the standardized test. That's huge. And nobody can argue with you and say, well, then games, that's just, you know, I don't want my kids to play games. We have to be serious. Well, you know what? There are kids who are doing this, and they're doing a lot better. So it's, it's a huge thing where one is able to show something in a way that, well, it's standardized testing, it's here, and that's big because then the federal grants, the state grants, open up their coffers and say, oh, University of Florida, here, now we'll give you a million dollars to develop a next game that will teach kids about nanoscience or, you know, whatever is the the concept because they see that this will actually have return on their investment. Um, the trend is definitely towards the mobile. Um, their mobile educational games are vastly outselling PC educational games. And I can say that most of the um, games that are being built are primarily targeting uh, iPad. iPad is becoming the uh, the computer or apparatus of choice, device of choice in most of the schools in the United States. So if you're thinking, if anybody's thinking about doing something, it's iPad first and then port to whatever, PC, Mac, Android, anything like that. But it's all really, it's amazing to what degree iPad is in schools um, where my kid for the first time learned of Microsoft because Microsoft bought Minecraft. So I was like, what's Microsoft? It's like, well, <laughs> this company that bought Minecraft. Um, so it's kind of interesting in that sense. Um, there are two major markets that we can identify. Uh, one is the corporate training games that um, are meant for training people. Here we have a game, uh, this, uh, a game, a product called uh, Shadow Health. And this is one of the projects that came out of University of Florida. So here we have a Unity-based game where a doctor is able to interact with patients and to heal patients by working with the avatars. Um, it's intended so instead of experimenting on real people, you experiment on these avatars, right? Um, and it's a huge field, big projects. Another field is game-based learning, much more common and maybe more interesting for us. Uh, primarily oriented towards children and general consumers, where we learn math, so on and so forth. A lot of it is focused towards younger uh, kids. Not a lot of games right now are available for high school or older kids. Um, it's more complex, more costly. It's easier to make a game how to do basic addition and subtraction. So that's also, you know, as the time goes on, the fields that are left that will be populated will be more complex, so there will be a greater challenge. So Dragon Box is one good example, and then um, that does algebra in an adaptive way, which is it will repeat millions of puzzles the same way until it gets to the point of understanding that says, aha, you solve this, you can move to the next level. It's ultimately patient professor. Great thing. Um, this is another example called Fold It. Uh, amazing uh, project done by the University of Washington where they uh, worked on that, how to fold protein. And they made a game out of it, and uh, the game proved to be tremendously popular. And they made a couple of breakthroughs in the first three months of their um, existence to the point that at one point in time they were to receive this tremendously uh, important medical award, and they were stuck with this problem because this medical award for solving something completely new was to be given to a gamer 
who knows nothing about medicine, who knows nothing about... All they were doing is they were just playing with this little protein with rubbers and doing it for points and nothing else, right? Um, so these things prove us that it's possible. We can make games that are fun. We can make games that help us promote uh, who we are. Uh, a lot of people from the industry are moving into the field of educational games. A lot of people with a lot of experience are moving into the field of educational games. So it's becoming real, the morphing between fun and learning. So I would like to encourage you to do make games and to do have fun and to do learn and to do better yourself and to enjoy life. Thank you. <laughs>